It's the How to Write Funny podcast. This is Scott Tickers, and I'm flying solo again this time. To follow up on my last two solo episodes to talk about how to write a satirical article, essay, sketch, or stand-up bit. This is the ultimate achievement of the comedy arts, is to write a short comedy piece. And so this is pretty advanced stuff. If you haven't listened to the first two solo episodes that I did, episode 31 of this podcast was about three fundamentals of comedy. If you're a beginner, I recommend you don't try to write a satirical piece right off the bat. Like I said, it's like, that's the peak of the profession. Start with the fundamentals, which are, number one, write 10 jokes a day. Get in the practice of that. Number two, Break through the psychological barriers that you have to writing. Beat writer's block and become a a writer who has ideas flowing out of their brain uncontrollably. I give you the steps to get there. And number three, avoid cliches. This is a rookie mistake that is almost universal. And if you are a beginner, you want to check out that episode and make sure that you're handling those things and you're good. And then the second solo episode I did was episode 33 which was how to write jokes. I went through the system that I developed for how to construct a joke, uh, a short comedy line. It could be a tweet, could be a title of a piece, could be a concept, whatever. There's a very clear process for that. You can also just sit and try to come up with them on your own, but if you have trouble with that, you need a little help. You You need somebody to like hold your hand while you go through it. That's what that episode is all about. And The reason you need to write jokes and the reason you need to know how to write jokes is that in order to write a longer piece, like a short comedy article or essay or rant or sketch or stand-up bit, I'm clumping those all into the, the same thing that I'm calling a comedy piece, you need to have a funny concept or title to work with. And the way you get that is by writing jokes. Some of you might be thinking, well, how can writing a short comedy piece be the pinnacle of the comedy arts? Surely there are bigger, better things like writing a comedy screenplay, a novel, a stand-up special. Those are long, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're the peak of the profession. When I say the peak, the pinnacle of comedy, I mean that in order to go any further from a comedy sketch or bit or essay, you have to start using dramatic structure, and it becomes a totally different beast. If you're writing a movie, that's primarily dramatically structured, and you're just peppering comedy in it. Same with a comic novel. A stand-up special is different, but that's really just a series of short bits strung together. There's no such thing as a stand-up special that's all one subject, for example. The comedian mixes it up and switches to different topics, and each little bit lasts anywhere from 30 seconds to maybe five minutes tops. Five to eight, we'll say, to be generous. But you don't want to err on the long side with this stuff. So it's the same with a comedy article, uh, written piece of any kind, uh, sketch, even a listicle. It's going to be in the five-minute range or less. That's the most that any audience can handle in terms of comedy structure. So what we're going to talk about here is how you do that. And as an example, I'm going to use an article, uh, a joke that I wrote recently that I'm, that I'm going to turn into an article. I've been trying to write more short essays recently just to stay in practice and keep my skills up. And I'm excited to put them out in a book collection at some point. Not sure when that'll happen. But so I wrote a joke that... I ran by my feedback group, which is the Facebook group, How to Write Funny. It's a private Facebook group where we critique each other's jokes and sometimes articles. And the joke that I got a pretty good response to there that I thought I could spin into a written piece was, I've had enough of my cat's hateful rhetoric. So that was a joke that got a pretty good response. So that's the headline that I decided to spin into an article. 
And so the first part of writing an article is the process that I just breezed right past there. It's writing a joke, getting feedback on that joke from a feedback group, but only if it's part of a list of several. You don't want to just have one idea and get feedback on that one idea. That really doesn't do you any good. You have to have at least 10 jokes. Worst case scenario, five. And I try to do, I try to write 10 a day. Lately, I've been posting five a day on the feedback group as part of this challenge that I issued for people to write 10 jokes a day until the end of this month. And then you get some feedback on those. People vote on them and you see which one people like the most. And then you, that's what you can work with. So that's the first step to writing a good satirical sketch or piece is coming up with a winning concept, not on your own. It's critical that you don't do that on your own. Comedy is an entertainment medium. You need to make sure that an audience is going to appreciate it. Otherwise, don't waste your time. And the only way you can know that is by showing it to a test audience and getting feedback. You can do that at an open mic night. You can test out your jokes. But in print, the only way you can do that is to send it to some people and have them give you some feedback or read it to some people if your group is in person. Now you have a joke that has gotten a pretty good response. People like it. They're like, oh yeah, I'd, I'd read that article if that, if that was the headline of an article. And now you have a leg to stand on. So you look at that joke and you ask yourself, okay, how can I spin this into an article? And so the next step is that you need to come up with joke beats for it. The way that comedy structure works is there's a funny concept and then there's a series of escalating joke beats and then they culminate in a button at the end. That's it. It's a very simple structure, but deceptively simple. It's really, really hard to do that well. And that's why it's the pinnacle of the profession. It's a perilous journey. It's like walking across a crevasse on Mount Everest on a tightrope. Because when you're trying to structure a comedy article, even if you have your great concept, that's analogous to the rope. And you've connected it to the other side of the crevasse. Every step on the rope that lands in which you don't lose your balance, that's a good joke beat. And you see now just how easy it is to come up with joke beats that are wrong. Just a little bit to one side, a little bit to the other side, you're going to lose your balance and you're going to fall. The comedy piece will fall apart and people will stop reading it. The audience needs to know that this concept that grabbed their attention in the headline that they want to read more about is going to be expounded on and escalated in a humorous way. In a sketch, the concept is, is not in the title, obviously, because sketches don't usually have titles. You just start seeing a sketch. What happens is they're revealed in the inciting incident. So there might be a line or two to establish the scene and the characters, but then there's what in improv they call the first unusual thing. Something weird or unusual will happen that'll get a little titter from the audience. That's the announcement of what the topic is of this sketch or what the concept, the comedic concept is behind this sketch. Another thing they call that is the game of the scene. It'll be like, oh, okay, it's a funny sketch where this person, this weird person is doing something weird or whatever. And then every joke after that is going to escalate that joke. As an example of how this looks in a sketch, remember that famous SNL sketch with Will Ferrell and Christopher Walken, the more cowbell sketch. It's the Blue Oyster Cult recording uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, and Will Ferrell is playing the cowbell in the sketch. So it's a very competently paced sketch. It isn't desperate to get to the joke beats because it knows as soon as it gets to them, people are going to love them. And the first unusual moment in that sketch, after several lines establishing the scene, establishing that this is the band, they're recording, and this is a famous producer who's uh, recording their song. 
they start playing and Will Ferrell is banging on the cowbell and it's kind of overtaking the song. That's the first unusual moment. So now we know the sketch is going to be about Will Ferrell playing the cowbell. We're not sure how it's going to escalate, but we know that that's the joke that's going to be escalated. That's the game of the scene. And the next beat of that sketch is when Christopher Walken comes out. Well, one of the band members stops the recording and says, hey, wait, 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 wait. And the audience knows what's going on. He, they know that he thought that that cowbell was too loud. So he stops the performance and says, uh, "That I'm not sure that was sounding right. And the producer says, uh, I thought it sounded great, but I, I do want to say uh, I need more cowbell. Audience laughs big. Now they know the trajectory of that sketch. And then that escalates throughout the sketch, and it gets more absurd how much he loves the cowbell. So that's the same thing in a written piece, where you establish the concept, you establish the first unusual thing in the headline. And the reason you have to do it in the headline, and you can't afford to do it within the body of the article like you can in a sketch, is because nobody's going to read that far. People are only going to read the headline. Usually it's going to be online, or even if it's in a magazine, like the New Yorker, they're going to read the headline and decide if they want to read the piece. Sketches are different because you're watching TV or you're watching YouTube, the sketch comes on, you're going to give it a couple of minutes to figure out what it's about before you judge it. The mediums are different, they have different rules. So your concept is in your title, and that title has to communicate fully the concept of this piece. So people know what the joke is, they know what they're laughing at, they know the subject matter. And then you need to build on a series of successive joke beats that all relate to that subject. So for my idea about the uh, cat's hateful rhetoric, we know that the joke beats are going to be centered on me having had enough of my cat's hateful rhetoric. So the joke is going to be, and I don't know what the jokes, I haven't brainstormed any joke beats for this piece I don't know if I'm even going to be able to here because that's a very intellectual process where I sit and, and write and I don't articulate those thoughts, but I'm going to try. I'll, I'll come up with a bunch of terrible joke beats here and maybe I'll be able to keep one or two of them. This is always the most embarrassing part of these solo podcasts is when I actually try to think up jokes on the spot. But I want to do that so that you understand that it is a ugly, dirty process that's not fun or glamorous in any way. It's kind of embarrassing because you realize how much you suck when you're just trying to come up with ideas. But you need a lot, and uh, you need them to be good. And the way you get quality in comedy is through quantity. So you have to churn out a lot of really bad, unfunny, unworkable jokes so that you can sift through the pile later and ferret out the tiny handful that might be actually good. This is how all comedy writing works. You pour out a ton of joke beat ideas for your piece, and you do that before you write the piece, because these jokes, the ones that work, are going to determine the take of your piece, because you're going to follow the funny. And wherever the funniest jokes are coming from, Uh, As long as they align with what the audience's expectations are for the title, you're going to be in great shape. And it's really hard to do that alone. The way that I prefer to do this, and it's the way that I always did it when I was the editor of The Onion, was do it in a group. Have the whole writer's room there, and you've already gone through the headlines, and you've picked the headlines that you want to write. Then you have the whole group riff on well, what should be some joke beats in this story? And people will start mentioning ideas. Some of them will land with a thud. A couple might be kind of funny. And people use those to say, ah, okay, aha, that's a funny take on this concept. Let's hear more like that. And it'll steer the conversation so that pretty soon everybody's in an ideal situation. Everybody's riffing on the joke with the right take. And when I say take, I mean the approach that you're bringing to this article. What's the angle? 
What's the specific type of joke you're telling? How are you telling this specific joke? The take is very important in an article because it depends on what the audience expected from the headline. You want to make sure that you're delivering on the audience's expectations. You want to deliver something unexpected, but while still satisfying their expectations. So I'll go back to the SNL sketch as an example. People expected the jokes to be about Will Ferrell playing the cowbell. They weren't sure what was going to happen. So when Christopher Walken came out and said he wanted more cowbell, that was surprising. We didn't know that that would be it. He's playing the comic character. The other members of the band are playing the straight man or the straight character because they're obviously thinking that this cowbell is out of place and weird. And then as the sketch goes on, it escalates. So Will Will Ferrell is playing too much cowbell. He's playing it right on the mic, totally overtaking the song. You don't know what's going to come next, but you know it's going to be about the cowbell. So he asks Will Ferrell to explore the studio space and go crazier with the more cowbell. So he does, the band members stop it again, and they say it's kind of distracting. So he comes back uh, for the next take, and he's sheepishly, like quietly doing the cowbell. But then during that joke beat, he subtly moves closer to the mic and closer to the head of the lead singer with the cowbell. And it's weird and funny and creepy and madcap. And then he gets upset and he kicks the mic down. So these are all joke beats related to the cowbell and the more cowbell. So they're staying on that tightrope very religiously. So important. But they're exploring different kinds of ways to build and compound that joke that are totally surprising and unexpected to the audience. And we'll get into how you expound and escalate a joke as we go along here. But that's the goal, is to make sure that you're on that tightrope with your joke and you're not veering from it. Structure plays a part in this too. What's the structure going to be of your piece? What's the format? In my case, it's pretty simple. It's going to be a first-person essay because that's what the headline or the title of the piece uh, makes you think it's going to be. So totally depends on what your joke is. If you have a fake news headline, obviously your your format and structure is going to be that of a fake newspaper article. Or if your headline is, you know, 12 weird ways to do whatever, that's obviously a listicle. So with a sketch, different ball of wax, we're talking about comedy concepts there, and the format will be determined by whatever the concept requires. The joke in your title and the riffing that you get on that joke are going to provide you clues as to what the most appropriate format and structure will be for the piece. It should largely be nothing more than what the audience expects it to be based on the headline. So back to my example, I've had enough of my cat's hateful rhetoric. To find the take of this story and to start brainstorming joke beats on my own instead of in a group, which would be great and helpful. And in the future, I should be asking the people on the Facebook group for joke beat suggestions. I don't know why I'm not doing that. I'm totally not taking advantage of that group. I'm like suffering in solitude. Silly. But for the purposes of this podcast, I'll try to brainstorm some stuff. So I'm just going to talk through like what the joke is and what's funny about that. What are audiences going to expect from that headline? They're going to expect some irony in that I am elevating my cat's meowing or moaning or whatever the cat is doing to the level of like political discourse. So it's like I'm ascribing human characteristics to the cat and ascribing more importance to what the cat is saying than than you normally would. So I think that's the core joke. And I think the audience is going to expect other terms related to hateful rhetoric, things like inappropriate speech and triggering and other words like that. So it's going to be a bit of a 
an analogy structure. And I went through the 11 funny filters in episode 33. Analogy is one of them, and analogy is a really nice funny filter to use as the structure for a comedic piece. They all have the ability, all 11 of them, to structure a piece. Analogy is one of the most commonly used because you find two disparate things and you find diff- connections between them. And every time you make a new connection, that's a new joke beat. And in this case, it would be connecting a cat, uh, like angrily meowing at you with someone in the political spectrum saying something that you, you find hateful or triggering or inappropriate in some way, offensive. So to come up with joke beats for that take and that story, what I would do then is just start writing bullet points on a sheet of paper before I start writing the article. It would be a big mistake to just start writing the article because what would happen is I would veer off take because I would start writing to amuse myself and I would forget where the audience is and what they expect. This happens so much in short comedy pieces where it starts one way and then it just kind of drifts off and rest assured when the writer drifts off, so does the audience. They're not interested anymore. They're done. They're going to give up on the piece. So I'm going to do bullet points. I'm going to write things like, uh, my cat said something inappropriate to me, or I was triggered by what my cat said earlier. I might say we were having an important discussion about the uh, not rights, but it would be like I'm trying to find the uh, the connection point here to make it an analogy. So I'm thinking of how you describe issues that you talk about, political issues that you might talk about in a discussion. So you would say, "I am. I was having a dialogue with my." cat, or I was having a tense dialogue, or I was opening it up to discussion, or things like that. And in in this situation, I would start researching how people talk about political speech, and I would look up articles about political correctness, and I would see how people talk about them, especially on the really liberal end of that spectrum people talking about uh, inappropriate speech or speech that makes people uncomfortable because it's offensive and triggering and not using the terminology that people prefer, like it's impolite or whatever. And I like this take because it's going to be subtly making fun of that speech. So it's going to be widely accessible across the political spectrum. I personally feel like political correctness is a good thing, and I think people who think it's a bad thing are really just annoyed that they can't be rude anymore. Political correctness is really nothing more than politeness. It's about calling people the terms that they prefer, which I have no problem with. So I think it is funny when people go overboard and they get triggered all the time because you're constantly saying the wrong thing to them. That can be super overbearing and annoying. But I also find it annoying when people say uh, that they're tired of political correctness and they just want to go back to the like derogatory slurs that they used to be able to use. Uh, that's awful also. So I feel like this article can tap into that. And that's my subtext. The subtext is we all need to lighten up about this stuff. And yes, of course, we all are allowed to express our wishes to be referred to by certain words or to be spoken to in a certain way. But we also need to be accepting of other people if they're not there yet, or if they don't know all the words. We can't be preemptively offended by them if they're just not up on how we prefer to be communicated with. So let's talk a little bit about subtext. 
in order for a piece to be satirical, it has to have subtext. You can write just a funny sketch, for example, the cowbell sketch on SNL. That's funny, but it's not satirical. It's not satirical because it's not making a statement about society, or it's not pointing out a human foible or a, a, something that the writer believes is wrong in society that should be corrected. It's just not doing that at all. It's just funny. So just funny is great. Humor is great. But we're talking here in this podcast about how to write a satirical article. And for an article to be satirical, it has to be making some kind of point. Now, the really important point of that point is that it can't be overbearing and it can't be preachy. That's super annoying. Audiences do not want to be preached to in their comedy. They just want to laugh. So as far as the audience is concerned, you don't want them to be necessarily thinking, oh, this is satirical versus this is just funny. You want them to just think it's funny, period. You want them to think they're just watching the cowbell sketch. And if they get like a secret subtle message between the lines and don't even realize it, that's perfect. That's ideal. You don't want necessarily people to know that they're consuming satire except on kind of a subliminal level. Some people will appreciate it, of course. There are going to be effetes in your audience who are going to want and expect that and want that and need that. But the vast majority of your audience is not going to be that sophisticated about comedy. They just want to laugh. And they're going to perceive it as extra funny if it is saying something meaningful about society that you are pointing out as some kind of wrong that should be corrected. So I'm kind of jumping around here, but I talked about the joke beats and how to brainstorm the joke beats and how I'm going to do that, where I'm going to just make bullet points of my joke beats. And I'll write down these joke beats that I mentioned, plus I'll research some terms that people use when it comes to politically correct speech. And I'll say that my cat and I were having an important political discussion about how I put the food out in the morning or how often I clean his litter box or, you know, silly stuff like that where I make it about the cat's world, but use the terminology that's normally associated with the serious political world in order to heighten the contrast of that, which brings out the irony of the piece. So I've got analogy working for me. I've got irony. uh, I've got uh, reference because I'm referencing political speech. So there's a lot of good funny filters at work in this article. So it certainly, that's what tells me that it has legs as a piece and that it's, you know, worthy of being written and has a good chance of actually working. And then I talked about the importance of subtext, knowing that in order to write a satirical work, you need to be saying something. And sometimes you find your subtext as you're brainstorming your joke beats, as I just did. And other times you might know going in, when you see the headline, you know exactly what the subtext is, what it's saying under the surface. It totally depends. Every idea is going to be different. So the next step, after I have that list of bullet-pointed jokes, is I'm going to churn out a really rough draft really quickly using those joke beats as my blueprint. But before I do that, I'm going to organize the joke beats because there's going to be a lot of random stuff, a lot of stuff that doesn't work. I'm going to go through and like arrange them from the least funny, the least involved, the least escalated to the most funny, the most involved and the most escalated so that I make sure that the joke is building and growing. And so I want to talk a little bit about how you recognize that. How do you escalate a joke in a piece, which is critical. The last thing you want is for the joke in your piece to not escalate or the the jokes in your stand-up bit to not build on one another because then they're just the same joke over and over and over. That's bad sketch writing. It's bad comedy writing. Audiences get sick of that really quickly. So here are some ways that you build and escalate. One is you build in other funny filters. So our initial funny filter in the cat article is, I would say, irony 
and analogy. So to escalate it, I might build in character. So we might learn more about who I am and who the cat is and some of the particulars about our relationship. And that can deepen the humor of what's going on between us that I'm, ha- I'm having enough of his hateful rhetoric. We can learn a little bit about perhaps our contentious relationship, for example. So adding in other funny filters. We can add character by deepening the character. We can add madcap like they did in the cowbell sketch in the second beat of that joke when Will Ferrell is really going nuts with the cowbell. He's dancing funny and his belly is popping out of his shirt. Great madcap moment. In the cat article, there's probably something I could put in there about the cat either running away or licking his butt or scratching some sort of physical slapsticky type of action that would be associated with a joke beat is going to make it feel like it's building and escalating. Another way you can build on a joke and escalate it is to increase the stakes. So how critical is the communication at the beginning of my article about the cat? Maybe it's about minor stuff, but as the piece goes on, maybe we're communicating about much more critical matters. Maybe I'll make a joke about how we're actually communicating about an important political issue uh, where lives are at stake or something like that. I don't know if it's Medicare for all or whether we call them concentration camps or detention centers, something like that uh, would deepen the state would, would increase the stakes. And a final way to escalate a joke is to simply make it unpredictable by throwing in random non sequitur elements. And always remember you have 11 funny filters. So the more funny filters you can add, the, the more options you have for escalating your joke. You can also introduce callbacks, which I would do sparingly, but that's another good way to escalate. It's not a bad idea to end a, a stand-up bit, especially with a callback joke. But we'll talk about endings and buttons at the end of this episode. For now, uh, one more way that you can escalate and build a joke is by keeping it unpredictable. So just throwing in random elements that the audience didn't expect, changing things up to keep it interesting. And it doesn't even have to be for humor's sake. It can be in a different location, a different time or place. Like I took my cat to the vet one time and we had words Uh, You know, stuff like that is going to make it feel like it's escalating. And I want to give you one more example of escalation in short comedy, because it, it is really important, and most people don't escalate enough, and it's always a challenge, and it's what makes comedy writing so difficult, because it's hard enough to write one joke. But when you have to write more jokes that are joke beats within an article based on that original joke, you have to keep making that joke funnier and funnier and funnier. So that's really, really challenging. And a great example of great joke escalation, one of the best examples I've ever seen is the show Portlandia. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And if you have, review it and you'll see what I mean. They escalate jokes so well on that show they build on them really quickly and they get into really weird territory really fast and they escalate beyond where you might have thought possible at the beginning of the sketch. One example is the Aliki Farms sketch where they go to a restaurant and they order the chicken and they start asking questions about, is it organic? What do they feed the chickens? And that quickly escalates to the waitress showing them the chicken's papers and information about the the chicken and how it lived its life, what its name was. But they don't stop there. Like they keep going with it. And the two restaurant patrons actually decide they need to go to the farm to visit and see how the chickens are taken care of before they can make a decision about ordering it. And 
it escalates beyond that because once they get to the farm, it seems very cultish. Like there's all these strange looking sort of like Amish seeming women feeding the chickens. And then they meet this cultish leader played by Jason Sudeikis who smiles at them. And it's clearly some sort of cult on this farm and they become indoctrinated into the cult and they marry him. And so we're way beyond the original concept of being at in a restaurant, a pretty typical restaurant sketch where you're just being overly concerned about the welfare of the, the meat that you're going to eat when it was alive. That's beautiful escalation. And it should be an inspiration to anyone who writes comedy because audiences love good escalation and they love when you can keep taking things further and further and further. That's the game that the audience wants to see. And like I said, it's really boring for them when the joke just repeats and it doesn't escalate. And it's always a challenge. That's always the challenge. How big can you make it while still staying on take? Because again, you're on that tightrope. And if you go in the wrong direction and take them in, in a direction that's off take, you've fallen off the tightrope and you've fallen into the crevasse and you're dead. All those escalated jokes in the Aliki Farms sketch have to do with them being concerned about the quality of the chicken because they would join a cult and marry this cult leader and they're with him on his deathbed at the end of the sketch because that's how much they care about the chicken. It was so strictly based on the original joke. And that's what I call joke discipline in a short piece or in a bit when you can stick religiously to the joke at hand. Really challenging, really impressive to see done well. So once I've figured out how my jokes should be ordered in terms of their escalation, going from the least escalated to the most escalated, and I'll decide, you know, how long I want my piece to be. I don't like to write a comedy piece any more than 500 to 1,000 words. I think that's just about right. So let's talk about the button of a piece. That's the last joke of a short comedy piece, also called the closer. And this is where you wrap everything up and you want a feeling of an ending, but you also have to keep escalating your joke. It has to be on track. It has to stay on track with whatever joke you are escalating throughout your piece. But there are a few different rules for a button or for the end joke, because you do want it to have a a sort of finality to it, a wrapping up, a little bow. Uh, depends, again, very largely on the piece. So let me just go over a few ways that you can think about closer jokes, and then I'll talk about possible closer jokes for this piece as an example. So one way you can come up with closer jokes is to introduce a new funny filter that you haven't introduced yet in the piece. That will give the joke a real sense that it's just a big shift that it's a kind of a new door opening up and that can be enough to give it a feeling of like you know oh we're kind of done with this uh another way is to just add a big twist you can well for my cat story for example uh you could have the cat turn out to be either part of my imagination or he uh, falls over and dies, uh, the, the dog chases him out of there, or if it's a smaller, more subtle piece, you just the introduction of the dog with a whole new issue, like the dog comes in and is like uh, sexually abusive to me, then that's a twist. That's a big twist. So it kind of takes that comedy universe that we're in and sh- shifts it to... A different situation. Another way to come up with closers is to double down on your joke. So that would be more escalation, bigger escalation, just like every joke before it, but in a more definitive or final way. Like there's no turning back. Uh, that would be a big escalation. That'd be hard, but it's it's doable. Um, another way is a callback joke. This is very common in stand-up. Almost every stand-up set ends with a callback joke. That's where you just refer to a joke that you told earlier in the set. 
and people love that. Audiences will always laugh and applaud at a, a callback joke, especially if it's a joke they liked the first time. It's that recognition of hearing it again that they are just totally in love with. It's like a, a reference joke on top of uh, the, the joke, whatever it was that you're calling back. And a final way to do a closer is to make a reference to reality. So every comedy piece is, exists in a fake reality. It's usually somewhat related to the real world, so we can all relate to it. Not, not always, but usually. But there's some one little thing is askew, and that's what makes it a comedy world. And by escaping that world and applying the rules of the real world to this world instead of the fake comedy rules that you had set up previously, subtextually, or rather uh, integrated within the exposition, that can be really funny and a, a nice way to end things by taking the reader out of, literally, you're taking them out of the comedy world. So it's like you're kind of opening the exit door for them. Some other examples. So the closer of the Portlandia sketch I talked about, the Aliki Farm sketch, the couple witnesses the cult leader dying and they've been, like, they marry him and they're in the cult and they end up going back to the restaurant and they kind of play with a few different closers. It's a long sketch. It's split into three parts so they can afford to kind of draw it out. But the first thing they say is, ah, we decided not to get the chicken, which in a shorter sketch, that would have been a perfectly fine closer. And then they say, uh, actually, we're interested in the salmon. And the one of them says, can you tell us a little bit about the salmon? So we know we're going to go down the same road again. That's kind of like the example I had with the dog where it's taking the comedy world and applying it to a different situation. And then the waitress goes away and they awkwardly make out uh, in the restaurant. It's kind of a weird little uh, non sequitur beat. It's very nice. The cowbell sketch closer was in, in the last joke beat. The, the band accepts the cowbell as a part of the song and Will Ferrell is playing it on the final take of the recording really happily. And the band is all happy and they freeze frame on Will Ferrell playing it with a in memorandum uh, phrase that comes up on the screen for the, that musician and his birth date and death date. And I don't know if any of that's real. It's probably made up, but uh, it's a nice little closer because it introduces a new funny filter, a parody reference to a kind of a documentary where they have the in memorandum at the end where it tells you where are they now or whatever. And that definitely feels like a closer because those are the things that you put on the ends of things. So those are a few examples of closers. Then, like I said, I'll spew out a really quick rough draft. I won't put a lot of energy into that at all. I'll just string together my joke beats with some connective material which will mostly be details about where I am, what my cat and I are doing, when we were talking. Maybe we were part of a political discussion in a, a town hall, or you know, I don't know what it's going to be. I'm going to have to figure that all out when I write it. But I'm going to crank out that first draft, and then I'm going to show that to people, and I'm going to get some feedback on that first draft. For me, I post it on the Facebook group and I get feedback from the group. And I learn a ton from that. And sometimes people don't know exactly what to say about a piece because they don't want to hurt your feelings and they'll say, oh, I thought it was pretty good, it's okay, or whatever. The really valuable critiques are the ones when people say, I thought it was okay, but it could have used more of X, Y, and Z. And they give you specific feedback on what they were missing because what they're telling you is that they expected something from the headline. And maybe once they started reading the piece, they expected something and they didn't get it. Really critical information to know. Because, like I said, you want to meet the audience's expectations. However, you want to meet them in an unexpected way. So your feedback group may not know the solution to your problems, but they're usually pretty good at pointing out the problems. And sometimes I'll post a draft to my feedback group and I'll get comments like, I thought this was really funny, really good, whatever. And I won't get any negative feedback or any constructive feedback. And that'll be really frustrating for me because 
I know it's a rough draft and I know it's not great. And I need people to be honest with me and just tell me, okay, but how could it be better? What's really missing here? And then I'll push people and then I'll usually get a couple of people to say, well, or even better, I'll try to draw out people who didn't comment on it at all, because those are really the most valuable critics right there. Why didn't they comment on it? They probably hated it, which is why they didn't want to say anything. Because, you know, they're just a abiding by that old rule of if you don't have anything nice to say, you shouldn't say anything at all. Nice in general conversation, but really harmful when it comes to critiquing comedy. I want those people to put up a post that literally says, I started reading this article, but I stopped because I didn't like it. It wasn't doing anything for me. That would be so incredibly valuable because that's the closest approximation to an actual reader that I'm going to get. No reader is going to read a whole piece out of a duty, a sense of duty to me to give me feedback. It just doesn't happen in the real world. It's a very artificial situation that you have when you're getting feedback. And that's the science experiment. You have to correct for that. So if somebody didn't even read or comment on your piece, you want to draw those people out and say, okay, why didn't you read it? Was it something about the headline? And if you started reading it and didn't like it, why didn't you like it? What could have been done differently to draw you in and pull you in? And if you can get an answer from that person, that's going to be gold, absolute gold. And so if I can get that, great. If I can't get that, I work with what I have from the constructive feedback that I got. And I'll usually get one or two people saying why the piece didn't work for them or how it could work better. And I might even get a couple of joke beat suggestions or someone will point out one or two joke beats in the piece that they liked. That's really helpful. Because then you can really zero in and refine your take and make sure that your take is really strong. Because in a first draft, it's probably not going to be that strong. You're going to have done your best, but you're going to kind of be dancing around the edges of a take. Getting a take and and zeroing in on it and making it really strict and having really strict joke discipline takes a couple of drafts. It's really tricky to do that in the first draft. So I'll get those notes from people and I'll go back and I'll start making corrections and I'll change a lot. Like I'll get rid of a lot of jokes that weren't aligning with the take. I'll insert new jokes and the comments that I get, even if they weren't specific joke suggestions, they'll steer me really well and I'll, I'll know, oh, okay, people didn't like that kind of joke, but they did like this kind of joke. I'll do more jokes like that. And that'll help me discover new joke beats that are much better than my old joke beats. And then I'll put together a second draft. And for me, once I do a second draft, if it's something really critical, I might send it to uh, another couple of trusted readers to get some final feedback. But at that point, I'm happy sending it to an editor at a publication that's going to run it and getting their feedback. And Usually they only have a couple of changes, which are usually good if they're a good editor. And then I'm good. I'm fine. I don't need to do like 20 drafts of something. When I was at The Onion, the way we would normally do it is you would assign the draft. You'd have the team riff on the subject matter so you'd get a bunch of good notes with potential joke beat suggestions. The writer would come back with the first draft. The group would read it and... They would give that feedback in person and say what joke beats worked for them, what didn't, was it the, was it on take or was it the wrong take? Sometimes writers will go off and they'll ignore the notes and they'll write a story that's the completely wrong take. Always a mistake. Always a mistake. And then the the group will will write that chip and get them to redo the piece with a second draft. And then once a second draft is done, what typically happens at least in my experience at The Onion, is you have everyone in the group read the story and make new joke suggestions. So they might punch up a a joke beat or two, or they might add new joke beats of their own. This is incredibly valuable. And it's one thing I miss about having an actual writer's room that's like a working paid writer's room, and that's their job full-time is it makes stories so much funnier when you can take your second draft and give it to a group of like five or six writers and have them punch it up and write 
replacement jokes, new jokes, uh, maybe get cut the, the two least funny jokes. You've just amped up the comedy potential of that story by a factor of five. It's a really valuable thing. And then I publish my piece and I'm off to the next one. And that, my friends, is how you write a satirical article. If you would like more, like I said, you can check out my book, How to Write Funnier, which is all about how to write a satirical article. If you're a beginner, I recommend you check out How to Write Funny, which goes into more detail about how to write jokes. And for more information about comedy writing, for more inspiration and tips and free ebooks, you can go to howtowritefunny.com and sign up for the email list. Shoot me an email if you have any questions about any of this stuff. I'm here to help and happy to do so. I hope this was helpful to you and I can't wait to read your article. Let me know when you get one published. Take care. Talk to you next time.